Welcome to the Every Student Succeeds Act, Advancing Equity for Students with Disabilities in Charter Schools webinar. My name is Lauren Miranda Rim, and I'm the Executive Director and Co-Founder of the National Center for Special Ed and Charter Schools. And in this webinar, I'm going to introduce you to charter schools as a concept, share data with you regarding special ed and charter schools, share some of the unique challenges and opportunities that are available in charter schools, as well as introduce specific issues from the Edu uh, Every Student Succeeds Act that are relevant to special ed in charter schools. So, overview of our PowerPoint that I just went through. Hope to answer the questions, what is a charter school? What is the National Center for Special Ed and Charter Schools? What do we know? What are unique challenges and opportunities? What ESSA provisions will impact special ed in the charter sector? So, what is a charter school? A charter school is a publicly funded autonomous school of choice created under authority articulated by a state charter school law. So, in the 2015-2016 school year, there were 43 states in Washington, D.C. that had charter schools, and there are a total of 6,800 charter schools spread out across the U.S. They enroll approximately 2.7 million students. Basic charter school bargain is that new schools are extended autonomy in exchange for accountability via parental choice and renewable charter contracts with charter school authorizers. So, charter schools are public schools of choice that parents, they are not a neighborhood school where specific students that live in an area are zoned to go to those schools. Rather, their students enroll in charters 100% based on choice, and they operate under a renewable contract with a charter school authorizer that extends a contract articulating what the charter school is expected to do in order to continue their operations. It's important to know that as public schools, charter schools are required to follow federal laws, and in particular, of interest for our webinar, all rules and regulations related to civil rights, such as those associated with Section 504, the ADA, and also with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So to understand charters, it's important to understand how they're governed. As autonomous public schools, they are part of the state system. However, they're different than traditional public schools. So in this diagram, you can see we've got the U.S. Department of Education up in the left-hand corner. They do not have any official authority over charter schools, except when they give charter schools grants under Title IV of ESSA um, and prior grant opportunities under prior iterations of the uh, Elementary Secondary Education Act. State education agencies and state boards of education are the ones who typically are the, the, the top of a, of a system in a state. And they, ser they may serve as authorizers if so designated by the state charter school law. However, the state charter school law may also designate that a local education agency, more commonly known as a district, can serve as an authorizer. And in this case, the local education agency, the charter school operates underneath that local education agency. Typically, the charter is considered part of the district. The third configuration is where an other entity, an other authorizer, grants the charter school authority to operate. Typically, the, the other authorizer would be an independent designated charter board, a local municipality, a nonprofit, or a college or a university that has been granted authority in the state charter law to grant charters. In that instance, they serve as the authorizer, and they are charged with holding the charter school accountable for fulfilling the obligations outlined in their charter. It's important to recognize that a charter is essentially a contract. It's an agreement between an authorizer and a school that outlines what the school is expected to do. So within the larger governance structure, charter schools can be identified as one of two legal, have one of two legal statuses. The first is that they operate as part of the LEA, and in which most often the LEA is typically the authorizer. In this instance, federal, state, and local dollars all flow through the local district, the LEA, to the charter school. In this in relationship, the local district, the charter, the district, provides the charter school with a combination of funding and services. And this is where it can get kind of messy because the charter and the district need to, na to negotiate what exactly that relationship is going to look like. In some instances, the authorizer may have a boilerplate contract and 
and treats all charter schools the same. In other instances, may negotiate different contracts with different charter schools. It just depends on how individual authorizers handle their relationship with their charter school. The vast majority of authorizers are, in fact, local education agencies, although typically they, they have only authorized one or two charter schools. In contrast is when the charter school operates as an independent local education agency. These are typically authorized by the state by, or another outside entity previously discussed in the prior slide. They, in this instance, when a charter is its own local education agency or district, federal, state, and local dollars typically flow directly to the school, although there's a great deal of state variation uh, related to how much charters get of local, local property tax revenue. Uh, but they do generally get all the federal and the state dollars that flow to traditional public schools. And then local is typically negotiated at the state legislature how much charters will get through the state. When charters operate as an independent local education agency, they're wholly responsible for all of their operations. So that would run from transportation to facilities, and also for including provision of a full continuum of services to students with disabilities. So there are pretty significant differences. When a charter school is its own LEA, they're wholly responsible for providing services to students with disabilities. Whereas if they're part of the LEA, they typically share that responsibility with the local district that ultimately, in the eyes of the law, have the responsibility for ensuring that students with disabilities are provided FAPE and LRE. So having introduced the basic concept of charter schools, I'd now like to tell you a little bit about the National Center for Special Ed and Charter Schools. The National Center was launched in 2013, and the mission of our organization is to ensure that students with diverse learning needs are able to fully access uh, and thrive in charter schools. The vision is the charter sector will fully embrace its responsibilities to meet the needs of all students and serve as a model of innovative and exemplary programs for students with disabilities. The catalyst that, came, that, that contributed to the creation of NCSECS was a recognition that while states and regulations, statutes and regulations articulate the rights of students with disabilities, there's a great deal of room for improvement to ensure that every student with a disability is followed is provided with a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And the autonomy extended to charter schools has the potential to create opportunities for innovation and to accelerate knowledge acquisition and program improvement. So we have a need in traditional public schools to have better services for students with disabilities. And while charters are created and given lots of autonomy to operate and there's opportunities for innovate, um, to date, many charter schools have not fulfilled their potential, and there's action required to ensure equity and quality of programs. So these two components together are really what led to the creation of the National Center in order to advocate for students with disabilities to make sure they can access charter schools on par with their peers. So thinking about special ed and charter schools, the current environment is that there are persistent questions regarding the extent to which students with disabilities can access charter schools and the quality of the programs for students with disabilities in the charter sector. We know that access and quality of programs are, in, are intimately linked in terms of parents' interest and ability to exercise choice for their students. It's not just about access. It's about ensuring that charters offer quality programs that parents are interested in sending their students to attend. We feel like there are opportunities at all levels of the system, at the federal, state, regional, and local level, to improve access and quality for students with disabilities in the charter sector. Charter sector is not effectively or consistently leverage its autonomy to create exemplary programs for students with disabilities. So all of these things together contributed to us launching the National Center to advocate for students and to serve as a resource to policymakers and practitioners who are striving to create high quality programs. Our work focuses on four areas. One is to document and disseminate facts and to ensure that discussions, whether it's policy or practical conversations about special ed and charter schools are based on facts and research and not on single case anecdotes. It's also to inform policy, both at the federal, state, and local level. It's to build bridges between charter school advocates as well as special ed advocates to bring them together to have a conversation about the best way to solve some of the unique challenges that charters are facing serving students with disabilities. And finally, we have an area of work called Creating Opportunities for Excellence where we partner uh, with 
two to three groups each year where we do where we engage in field work where we feel like we can have an impact on students, but also uh, uh, generate lessons that could be applied to the broader field uh, through our work. So that's a little bit about the National Center on Special Ed and Charter Schools. So the next slide, in the next few slides, I want to share some of our recent research before we shift and discuss some of the unique challenges and opportunities in the charter sector. So in 2015, the National Center conducted a secondary analysis of the U.S. Office for Civil Rights, Civil Rights Data Collection. And so the next few slides introduce you some of the data. Uh, the Civil Rights Data Collection represents a every other year survey of all the public schools in the nation. So these are data that represent the universe of public schools. And so there are credible uh, documentation of what is going on in the education sector. When we dove into our secondary analysis of the civil rights data collection, we had four primary questions we wanted to answer. How many students with disabilities are enrolling in both traditional public schools as well as charters? Where are students with disabilities being served in both types of schools? To what extent are students with disabilities being suspended and expelled in charter schools relative to traditional public schools? And finally, to what extent are state charter laws leading to the creation of specialized schools for students with disabilities? And by specialized schools, I mean schools that are solely or primarily um, designed to serve students with disabilities. So on the first question, what we found is that in 2000, the, the CRDC collection, data collection in 2011 and 12, that across the nation, 12.55% uh, of students in public schools, and this is solely traditional public schools, there isn't an overlap between traditional and charters, they're separate uh, samples for our analysis. 12.55% of the students in traditional public schools are of a diagnosed disability that qualifies them for services under IDEA. In contrast, public sc ch charter schools, 10.42% of the population qualify for services under IDEA. So slight difference between those two schools. We also looked at students that were being served under 504 and found basically no discernible difference. Traditional public schools, it's about 1.53%, and in charter schools, it's 1.52. What's interesting is that the Government Accountability Office had released a report in 2012 that had tracked trends uh, of students with disabilities in charter schools. And what this chart shows us that dating back to 2008 and data from 08, 09, 9, 10, and then 11, 12 school year indicate that it appears that a greater percentage of students with disability or a greater percentage of the students in charter schools are students with disabilities. So the charters are enrolling more students. So the trend is upwards. So the first chart shows what that percentage is. Um, across those three years. And the second chart under enrollment difference shows that the difference between traditional public schools and charter schools is decreasing. Now, we don't know from looking at these data what the cause of that change is, but we find this to be encouraging as we think the field overall, be it uh, state, state, state uh, departments of ed, authorizers, schools, as well as parents and support organizations are all collectively pushing charters and that we think some of this trend of charter schools serving more students with disabilities is a positive trend because it means that more students are having access, but it appears that there is room for improvement in this area. So the next piece of data that we analyzed from the CRDC pertains to placement. We wanted to understand what, how much of individual students' time were they spending in the general ed versus in a pullout situation in both types of schools. And what we found is that in traditional public schools, uh, students, roughly 67% of the students with disabilities are spending 80% or more of their school day in the general ed classroom. And in charter schools, that was 84, just over 84%. So it appears that more students with disabilities are being served in more inclusive classrooms in charters. And the other two data points reflect that, that conversely, uh, chart traditional public schools have more students being uh, served uh, in, in some pullouts, so they're spending between 40 and 79% of their day in the traditional classroom, whereas 9.6% of students in charters are getting pulled out to that extent. And then finally, um, when you look at students who are, who are being served in substantially separate or spending 39% or less of their day in the general ed classroom, traditional public schools, 
11.67 and charter schools 4.29. So again, one of the things that the, the analysis of the civil rights data collection that can be somewhat frustrating is that it gives us data, but we, we don't know exactly what is contributing to the data and that we're hoping through the work that we're doing in the field and additional analyses of future years of the civil rights data collection will give us a bit more insight. So a particular note, what we don't know regarding these inclusion data is, is this in fact a reflection of charter schools using more inclusive practices and embracing inclusion more and serving more students in inclusive classrooms? Or is it simply a fact, a byproduct of the fact that charter schools are serving more students who are generally served in more inclusive settings? So we're hoping that future analyses of the civil rights data collection will enable us to answer that question. Um, and also a note about that, given the variety that we see in between states and individual schools, we're guessing that the answer is probably a combination of both of those. So the third data point that we examined uh, pertained to uh, discipline, and so we looked at both suspensions and expulsions. And what we found, what's most notable in this, this part, um, is that whereas all students are typically both in, in traditional public schools, between 6 and 7 percent of all students will be disciplined during the school year and experience at least one suspension, whereas students with disabilities can anticipate being disciplined at twice the rate, obviously a significant concern. The U.S. Department of Education's Rethink Discipline um, initiative is really trying to focus on this and trying to change the trends related to disproportionate discipline because we know that when students are disciplined, they lose access to instruction, you know, critical instructional time. They're not in the general ed classroom and they're not able to continue their learning. So this is a problem. Interestingly, when you look at students with disabilities and traditional to charters, it's roughly the same. Charters are suspending just a small percentage more um, you know, 0.05% than traditional public schools. Um, with expulsion rates, the overall trend of students with disabilities being disproportionately disciplined holds true with expulsion as it did with suspension. However, in this instance, charter schools are, are expelling slightly, you know, over just under 1% more students with disabilities, which obviously is a concern um, and something that um, we will continue to track and, and work on in terms of trying to push charters, make sure they understand um, how discipline works, how it should work, and, and supporting efforts to create positive learning environments in schools. But obviously concern and something that we're also working with authorizers to push them to ensure that they're collecting data and reporting out on um, discipline rates of all students, but specifically with students with disabilities. So, the fourth data point pertains to specialized charter schools. So um, one of the trends that we've seen in charter schools is that groups of parents or, or other interested parties have created the charter, state charter laws have created an opportunity for groups to start specialized, either wholly or primarily specialized schools that serve students with disabilities. And what we found when we looked at the the schools and the civil rights data collection data set was that there were 100, we were able to identify 115 of these schools. And our definition was that they either self identified as a specialized school or their enrollment of students with disabilities was 25% or more of their total population. So more than twice the national average would have tipped those schools over to being specialized in our, for our definition. Uh, what we found was that those schools are primarily clustered in Florida, Ohio, and Texas. Um, and in terms of the focus of those schools, the next chart shows you that the majority of those, the schools that are specialized, and this is due to, from our web searches and trying to understand what the schools do, they identified themselves as being general, quote unquote, general special ed schools or serving two or more, or students from two or more IDA categories. But then when you look to the left side of the chart, you see where there's some some areas of clustering of specific disabilities. So charter schools that are being created for students with autism represent 13% of those specialized schools, and students with emotional disturbance, 13% as well, and then, and then other disability categories, smaller percentages. But this is a trend that we will continue to track. We, we will post this information on our website. It's been in the report that we released this past fall, and we will be continuing to track the growth and focus of these schools, because understandably this is a concern. 
um, because students are being served in more segregated settings. However, the, the research that we've done on the ground and talking to um, the schools about how and why they were founded, but also uh, in, in anecdotal conversations with parents, is that these schools are being created because parents have not been able to find a, a, a positive learning environment for their student, and so they're creating these schools. So um, that will be an area that we'll continue to watch because of obvious concerns regarding these restrictive environments. So shifting, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the challenges, unique challenges that charter schools face relative to traditional public schools when it comes to serving students with disabilities. So the first challenge is that there is an inherent tension between people who are starting charter schools and the whole concept of special ed is that most people starting charter schools are creating these schools in order to take advantage of the less regulated environment to be to be experimental in terms of how the school is governed or how they configure their teachers or their classrooms, their facilities. And then in the contrast, special ed is a highly regulated uh, component of public education and that there can be an uh, inherent tension of a school that's trying to do things that are new and different but at the same time needing to adopt many of the same structures that traditional public schools are currently adopting. Where we see this tension in particular is when charters are part of a local education agency. So you might have a local education agency that says to the charter, well, you need to do everything the way we're doing it. And the charter says, well, but the whole reason we created this charter was because we wanted to be project-based learning or arts focused. And that may be a conflict with how the district implements their special ed program. So uh, the uh, deregulated charter schools have introduced a whole new element um, for for traditional districts thinking about their special ed programs. So the other tension pertains to how decisions are made about how students with disabilities will be served in schools. So a student is identified as qualified or eligible to receive services under IDEA. Decisions are made by a team of parents and specialists from the schools and teachers that decide what they think collectively is best for that student. That's in the ideal situation where everyone comes to the table and comes to a consensus. Um, however, with parental choice, parents are able to make those decisions unilaterally and they do not need to confer. They don't need to get approval from the IEP team, um, the I IEP team in order to make that decision for the students. And again, where this conflict can come up is when a charter school is part of a local district and the local district says, well, we think the student with a disability would be better off served in a traditional district school because we've got this existing program. But mom or dad is saying, well, I'm really interested in sending my child with autism or, or a child who's deaf to this charter school because I really like that they've got an arts education program that no one else in the district offers. And the parent is able to make that decision. And then the new IEP team working with the, with the charter school personnel will need to make decisions about how the students serve. But there's an inherent tension there between how decisions have always been made about how students with disabilities are served versus what happens when the parent wants to enroll in the charter school. So the whole notion of legal status can also be a challenge for charters as well as for parents and community members and understanding what a charter school's responsibilities are. As I mentioned earlier, charter schools um, can either be their own local education agency and be legally autonomous or charters can operate as part of the local district. In that case, you need to negotiate with the district to decide how students with disabilities are served. And it can be confusing in terms of understanding who is responsible and accountable for what. When a charter school is its own LEA, the responsibility lines are relatively clear because the charter school is its own district. It's equivalent to any other traditional district. But when a charter school is part of a district, Understanding who is responsible for what can be challenging, especially for parents who are trying to navigate or potentially advocate for their student if they want to change something about how their student is being served in the school. So there are also practical challenges associated with providing a full continuum of placements, giving lack of resources or economies of scale. This challenge is particularly prominent in charter schools that are own LEA. It's a single school operating as an entire district and they typically have fewer resources, and, and then they also don't have the ability to develop any economies of scale. So whereas a traditional district might be able to hire a teacher who specializes in, in students who are blind because there are five students across the district, and that 
teacher might serve students in five different schools. In a charter school, they might need to find a, uh, a teacher a specialist who um, has expertise regarding students who are blind, but they only need a quarter of that person's time because they've only got one student. So there are just some very practical challenges associated with a single school being a district um, in creating that full continuum of placements within the school or by contracting out to do it. Also, on a practical level, what we've observed and research has proven is that there's a lack of technical knowledge and specialized capacity in new and small charter schools. Most districts benefit from a long history of operating special programs and offering special ed and related services to students with disabilities and have a history and they have knowledge base and resources that they can draw from. But a brand new charter school doesn't have that. They're doing everything new for the first time. And so it can take time for them to build all the capacity they need. And they can't build it all at once because they don't know who's going to enroll in their school. So again, this isn't to make excuses for charters, but just to explain what some of the technical challenges that they face trying to build capacity. And where they may actually be turning to, to special ed structures and states to build their capacity to serve more students with disabilities. Um, uh, there are also funding disparities between traditional public schools and charter schools. And most of this stems from the fact that most charter schools are not able to access local tax revenues or facilities. And so they need to stretch their general operating dollars farther, which affects all of their finances. In some states, charters are funded at about the same level. But in other states, it can be significantly less, operating on 20 to 30% less than a traditional public school. And so again, on a practical level, it can be harder for them to stretch their dollars um, across more programs and diverse programs than a traditional school would. And this can impact their ability to build capacity related to serving students with disabilities. Another lesson from the field is that the charter sector, while it has attracted good actors, it has also attracted bad actors. And it's critically important that the structures in states and parent advocates and, and other support organizations strive to support the good schools and strive to highlight and, and, and close the bad actors and the bad schools that are operating. And that's the key role of authorizers, is to hold charter schools accountable for the uh, performance metrics outlined in their charter. And when they fail to meet those obligations, they need to close charter schools. But the practical reality is that in the 25 years since we first had charters, not all authorizers are great about doing that, which leads us to the last slide related to some of the challenges, which is that authorizer accountability is absolutely critical. So. If, if you are advocating for a student with a disability, one of the things to understand is who is that charter school accountable? Who gave that charter school permission to operate? And how do you go up that line of authority if there's a concern you have about the way that the student, the, that the school is serving students with disabilities? So, and I think looking back on 25 years of, of conducting research and, and, and tracking the charter sector, I think the, our knowledge and and level of intentionality of ensuring that authorizers have the ability to fulfill their function is one of those areas that the, the charter sector is just starting to catch up on, and that early on not enough attention was paid to quality of authorizers and ensuring that they are holding all schools accountable for providing a high quality program to the students they serve. So having talked about some of the challenges, I'd like to talk to you about some of the opportunities that we see in the charter sector, which is really what drives our work at the National Center. So the first is that state charter laws create the legal framework to create mission-driven schools that include students with disabilities by design rather than an add-on. And we've seen this. We've seen examples of charter schools that from the beginning integrated universal designs for learning or embraced uh, a robust response to intervention program as a core part of their curriculum with the goal of having fewer students with disabilities, fewer students identified for special ed but enrolling a diverse array of students and students with different learning styles. And that's one of the exciting things that we have seen in charters on the positive front, is that they've used that autonomy to create the kind of school that serves all students by design, as opposed to saying, well, we're going to serve general ed students, and then as an after afterthought, we're going to provide some support to students with disabilities. Also, New autonomous schools can develop innovative service provision models in a time-compressed manner, absent having to overcome existing policies and practices. If you look at the history of special ed, there are varying degrees of, of quality of programming in part because many districts can get stuck in the, this is the way we do things, or this is the way we've always done things, or this is a child with XYZ 
the XYZ disability, so this is how we serve them. And then in the charter sector, while being new is one of the challenges of the sector, it can also be one of the positive aspects in that uh, when they approach trying to figure out how to provide an individualized education program, they look at it with fresh eyes and trying to think about what is the best way? How do we most effectively integrate the student into the program and to support them in the general ed classroom as opposed to pushing them out into existing programs? So that's another opportunity. The third opportunity is the creation of online um, online and hybrid blended learning environments that can support highly individualized and personalized learning. However, this is not without its problems. Recent research has indicated that the vast majority of virtual schools are not meeting expectations and are not offering high quality programs. So I feel like when we think about online and hybrid, we're really at the beginning of a continuum where I think the, the mode of delivery really has a lot, there's much room for improvement. However, the upside is that the notion of hybrid, hybrid or, or blended learning could be the ultimate example of individualized and personalized learning, which could be so critical to students with different learning styles. So I would say this is an opportunity that is yet to be fully leveraged, but something that um, is, a, is a, a positive potential or opportunity in the charter sector. So having introduced what charter schools are, shared some of the data, given you some insight to the opportunities and challenges, I'd like to shift now to discussion about the implications of Every Student Succeeds Act, specifically for students with disabilities enrolling in charter schools. So a bit of a primer on process. So the law was passed back in the middle of the winter, going through a process of negotiating rulemaking where based on what the law says, we try to come up with what the regulations are going to look like. Just this past week, new draft regulations were released out for comment, and then um, in a few months we'll, we'll have final regulations and look to have ESSA being fully implemented in 2017. So when we look at the law, there are a couple of key things that um, represent significant changes from prior iterations of the Elementary Secondary Education Act, which was previously referred to as No Child Left Behind. So Elementary Secondary Education Act was the original law that was passed in 1965. It's gone through a couple of different names and iterations, most recently No Child Left Behind. So ESSA maintains the basic architecture of standards-based reform in that all schools are still required to, to administer annual assessments in grades three through eight and once in high school. They're required to administer science assessments in three grand grade bands, three, five, five, eight in high school. States must set quote unquote challenging academic standards. State designs States are supposed to design one accountability system with annual determinations of schools and districts. And they're supposed to disaggregate data by student subgroups according to poverty, disability, English language learners, as well as minority status. And states are required to develop interventions for their lowest performing schools, lowest performing 5% of all schools and high schools that fail to graduate at least one third or more of their students. In combination, while they the, the new law represents the basic architecture of standards-based reform. It's a significant shift in terms of the authority and discretion at the state level, whereas NCLB had a great, the, the federal government and the U.S. Department of Ed had um, a much greater opportunity to influence what was going on at the state level. Under ESSA, um, much of that discretion has been shifted down to the state for states determining, for instance, what their high school assessment is going to be and what those challenging standards are going to be and what the interventions are going to be for low performing schools. So major shifts between NCLB and um, from when we had the ESEA waivers. Um, there are no requirements for states to implement teacher evaluation systems and or link results to student test scores. Um, it allows for far more fiscal flexibility in how they can spend primarily their Title I dollars. Um, the constructs of adequate yearly progress and highly qualified teacher are eliminated from the statute. Um, there's no more focus on quote unquote college and career readiness, um, but there is a focus on all children receive a high quality education and close student achievement gaps. Really an important point, which I'm going to talk about in a minute in terms of how we can be holding schools accountable for achieving that goal. It expands support for early learning, which is so critical to students with disabilities, but also focuses on school climate and safety and other factors affecting student learning. Um, 
And finally, there's no required school turnaround models or specific interventions. So whereas the law does require states to intervene when a school is performing, unlike NCLB, it doesn't dictate what the actual interventions need to be. So these are some pretty significant shifts in terms of how accountability plays out for academic outcomes for students, all students. Other shifts is that it requires state Title I plans to include how to support districts in reducing bullying, overuse of disciplinary practices, and use of aversives, for, for example, seclusion and restraint. It allows, but does not require, supplemental services. It allows pay for success initiatives as defined in the Act. Um, Title II uh, funds are transferable. Title II are the school leader, teacher recruitment and training, and Title IV and Title uh, the 21st Century Schools and states can decide how to use those funds. So that's what I meant earlier when I said the flexibility. It adds a new literacy grant program called the LEARN Act. It adds a new comprehensive center for students not achieving full literacy due to disability, including students with dyslexia. It adds new early education grant program. Decrease the secretarial authority, as I mentioned earlier. There's a pretty significant shift from NCLB to ESSA in terms of the role of the Federal Department of Ed, and specifically the, the um, both in terms of dictating um, how it will be implemented and, and now the states have more discretion, but also it limits the secretary's discretion um, or authority in terms of how the law is implemented. It allows states to determine the evidence-based interventions to implement the lowest performing schools. Districts are able to determine the interventions and timing when one or more subgroups lag behind. Fairly controversial change, on one hand states uh, and, and districts and some key stakeholders are pleased with the discussion that states have, but I think there is con warranted concern in terms of the extent to which all states will hold all students to high accountability or high academic standards. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in practice. So final slides, I want to talk a little bit about specific parts of ESA that will really have all of these, the things I introduced, apply to traditional as well as to chartered public schools. How there are a couple of sections of the law that are very specifically for charters. So Title I applies to charters as public school, but also in ESA, ESSA, there's Title IV, which is Part C, which is the charter school grant program. So that, that is a grant program that states and individual charters can apply to the federal government to get dollars but there are specific expectations attached to those dollars. So first, as I mentioned early, all civil rights apply to all schools, including charter schools. ESSA articulates the important alignment of all federal education statutes, such as Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, Section 504, the Rehab Act, and the American with Disabilities Education Act. All these civil rights statutes apply to all public schools, charter as well as traditional. Charter schools must not discriminate against students with disabilities, and they're required to provide the services and support that students with disabilities need in order to achieve their full potential. So this was in prior iterations of the law, but it's an important emphasis because um, I do think there's still some confusion among some in the field about the extent to which, A, that charter schools are public, and B, to which they are required to follow all of these federal statutes. And as a basic foundation, it is critically important to recognize that all charter schools are public and they must follow all federal statutes. And so any questions about who they're serving and how they're serving them, you really can refer to, well, they are public schools and these are the requirements of public schools. Where there are differences is in terms of how state rules and regulations apply to charters, but not federal. All federal apply to charters just as they do to traditional public schools. Um, moving forward, there's new language in the law that wasn't in NCLB regarding new requirements to recruit, enroll, and retain students with disabilities. So the ESSA specifically identifies the goal of expanding opportunities for traditionally underserved students, including students with disabilities, as a goal and purpose of the law. And that any entity that receives grants, whether they're an authorizer or otherwise, are bound to create and sustain systems by which charter schools commit to recruit, enroll, and retain, and foster achievement for students with disabilities. This is an important piece. There have been some questions in recent research published by the National Association of Charter School Authorizers has really put a fine point on the fact that many authorizers are not fully embracing this responsibility. So the language in ESSA gives us more of a foundation to then, to then 
go to authorizers and require that they uh, hold charter schools accountable and ensuring that they're meeting their obligations under federal statutes and specifically the civil rights statutes. But overall, we know that charter schools can and must do better in this area, and that state and local planning that's so central to so much about Title I must not only encourage but require that charter schools do this. And part of that is ensuring that charter schools have a place at the table on that state planning. That's the best way to have an influence on what charters are doing is to bring them to the table for the state planning of how Title I rules and regulations will be implemented and, and improvements will be made at the state. So in terms of discipline, ESSA's Title I requirements for state planning require states to show how they will support districts in reducing bullying, overuse of disciplinary practices, and averse, as I mentioned earlier. And as part of this, states are required to both plan and support traditional and charter schools in reducing practices that disproportionately impact students with disabilities. Looking back on the last 25 years of the evolution of the charter sector, in many states, charters have been left alone to essentially function as islands. And they have not tapped into the, the, the complex and robust support systems that states have in place for a whole variety of things, whether it's Title I or um, uh, school to work or um, you know, a variety of different federal programs that are implemented at the state level. Charters frequently are either not on mailing lists or not aware of those resources. And so we anticipate promoting and pushing states to ensure that charter schools are part of the planning and that states are really taking ownership for if charter schools are not performing, A, either closing them or B, making sure that they're implementing the policies and procedures to ensure that, that, that they have the ability to create safe and supportive school environments in line with the new requirements under ESSA. So, ESSA also specifies that states and authorizers bear the responsibility to ensure that grantees under Title IV, Part C, that's the Charter Schools Grant Program, uh, provide a high quality education. So again, as I mentioned earlier, there, there have been some, there's been some recent research and overall looking at the last 25 years of charters, some concerns about the role that authorizers should play. And so the language in ESSA is an important statement regarding the role and responsibility that authorizers have to ensure that charter schools are fulfilling their obligations to Title I as well as, well as the obligations outlined in Title IV related to charter school program grants. This is really the cornerstone of the charter law as well as the core of ESSA, is making sure that charter schools and all public schools are positioned to provide a high quality education to all students. So I'm going to wrap up my presentation with briefly sharing with you some of the, the um, the draft regulatory language specifically related to the annual report card. What have we found in the charter school is that transparency can be critically important to influencing behavior. So some of the language in the regulations pertains to reporting and specifically for each authorized public chartering agency in the state, they should, the regulations propose that they, sh the proposed regulations dictate that charter schools should be reporting the percentage of students in each subgroup relative to what the percentage of those students in their local education agency, as well as how the ach academic achievement for students in each charter authorized by such agency compares to that for students in the LEA. So these two requirements set up a framework for charters to be required to report who they're enrolling relative to the local district as well as the outcomes for those students. And our hope is that this transparency will go a long way towards helping authorizers and state policymakers push charter schools to ensure that they are not only open to students with disabilities, but prepared to provide high quality programs that will enable students with disabilities to perform on par with their peers. So with that, I'll turn to my last slide. If you have any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Oh, I apologize for that formatting, but you can uh, find uh, resources uh, produced by NCS ECS on our website or follow us on our Twitter. And if you have any follow-up questions to the presentation, don't hesitate to reach out and send me an email. Thanks for dialing in.